Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Friday night interview for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to have with me Brother David, who does a program also every Friday night called Friday Fundamentals for uh, the Talking Doctrine channel. And I've been watching uh, his videos uh, now for several weeks, and I'm, it's actually now is the very first time I've actually have a chance to actually meet and talk to Brother David. So I'm really looking forward to getting to know him tonight. Uh, if you're in the chat room now, and uh, as we're going through these, uh, this uh, ex interrogation, I mean, um, examination, uh, I mean, um, interview, I'm not going to be examining you or interrogating you, brother. Don't worry. You're okay, man. It's going to be, it's going to be relatively pain-free, I think. But uh, uh, if anybody in the chat room, and uh, if you think of questions that you want me to ask or you want to uh, respond to our, our conversation, uh, if you want us to address any of these points or questions you have, uh, feel free to uh, put it in the chat room, but also put it in all caps. If you post it in all caps, it'll get my attention, okay? All right, so hi, Brother David. Uh, hey. You you must be, uh, 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 I guess, um, now that now that you've been got your feet wet on talking doctrine now for several weeks, uh, um, you probably have a lot of plans for uh, what you want to do with talking doctrine in the future but uh the, the little bit of time that you've uh, you've been on your program so far what's your how do, how do you think it's going but what, what's your response to uh your your program oh well i mean it's going good i'm trying my best to follow the lord's lead and what to talk about because i like talking about flat earth a lot so it so as the lord leads i'll go that direction but sometimes he, he takes me another direction so just trying to follow whatever he has because I don't know the hearts of the people. You know, I don't know where they're at. I don't know how much knowledge they have, what they're studying. If they're studying, I have no idea. So I want the Lord to give them what they need each Friday. Uh, well, I'll tell you, my first reaction to you uh, re in response to just your personality is uh, you are full of energy. I'm going to put my coat on. Um, a bit. Oh, by the way, look at my shirt here. Can everybody see that? This is a YouTube salvation shirt. God wants you to be saved. Uh, someone bought this for me about 10 years ago when I first came on YouTube. So uh, thank you, Sister Joy, for doing that. That's her name. Uh, yeah, your personality is really uh, quite energetic and enthusiastic, and it's fun to listen to you. Do you think you can get your personality to rub off on Matthias a little bit? Uh, he's like, I have, seem like he's like falling asleep half the time. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm I'm tired when I come here and and speak on Fridays. Though when I go home, I crash. Yeah. I'm glad I'm, I'm off on Saturday. Is why Friday works for me because I I go to work early in the morning. So for, it needs to be Friday. So I don't know if I can rub off on him. I'll try. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want Matthias to rub off on you because uh, you've got uh, just the right amount of enthusiasm, and we need to get bring Matthias up to speed. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, I'm sure Matthias can, uh, it would be good for him to rub off on you theologically. But uh, my, my impression of you so far is it seems like you are quite knowledgeable uh, biblically, uh, considering uh, your young age, uh, you probably don't think of yourself as so young, but I'm 68. Everybody seems young to me now. <laughs> um, all right, now let's get started here. Uh, you, uh, and I was talking about your young age, so if it's not too personal, I mean, normally a man doesn't object if asked their age, and uh, young people probably are not as concerned about their age they're not as self-conscious that oh i'm getting old but you seem relatively uh young to me uh, if you don't mind telling us could tell us your age or, or thereabouts i'm 37 oh 37 see i i would have guessed you're like 27 
Okay. Wow. Well, that's good. I, if I shave my beard off, it'll look like that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Interesting. 37 years old. So uh, my son is 39. So you and Matthias are, are uh, right? My son's generation. Uh, now, you uh, you live nearby, uh, Matthias? Yeah, about five minutes down the street. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you're related, aren't you? Or is uh, it you're related to Daniel? Uh, Daniel is my brother-in-law. I married one sister. He married the other sister. Woohoo! That's, that's efficiency. Beautiful. <laughs> That's how we're related. Wow. Okay. Just make sure you don't go any further and do any intermarrying. Okay. No, no, we're done with the whole marrying thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, you, you live uh, near Pensacola. As far as I know, Matthias is in Pensacola or close. It's yeah. It's Milton. It's near Pensacola. Okay. Uh, so that's where you live, but uh, were you born in that same place or somewhere else? I was born in Deland, Florida, which Where? is near Deland, which is near Daytona Beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's where I was born. Mm. I, I'm not familiar with it. It's probably not a real big place because uh, no. otherwise we would have heard of it. But after I finished college in '74, I moved to Florida for my uh, work, and I traveled from Fort Pierce to Key West in my job. That was my area, and. Uh, so I got to learn all those cities along that, that East Coast, but uh, I haven't heard of uh, that town, so it must not be right on the coast then, huh? No, it, it's kind of a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and, and that's how far away from uh, Pensacola? Uh, my hometown? Yeah, your hometown. Yeah, it's about 400 miles. 400 miles? Okay. Uh, all right, so we're going to go back in time 37 years to the uh, – um, your birth and your youth, but this is a question I just like asking because it's fun and it has nothing to do with, you know, our ministry or anything, but it's just a curiosity. And that is, uh, what is your earliest memory? Earliest, the earliest memory. thing you remember in your entire life. Well, I look at I look at some of my mom's old pictures, and I don't really have the memories of those times. But um, earliest memory memory, maybe I was seven, six or seven when my mom she we after church she would always say let's um, everybody has to take a nap, and we were like we don't want to take a nap, and she's like well you can't be running in and outside so. She, we said, all right, well, well, let's just go outside. She's like, you got to stay outside until I wake up. And we're like, that's a deal. We're, we'll oh, go out and we'll stay out. That's wow. probably the earliest one that I can remember, six or seven, something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, wow. Um, that's almost the same um, experience I have. Is, uh, my earliest memory is also related to taking naps. I remember when I was in kindergarten. The entire experience of kindergarten, everything about it, but especially, of course, there was nap time, and you'd lay out your towel on the floor, and you'd, everybody would take a nap. And uh, I don't remember anything before kindergarten, though. But uh, uh, but that was. Um, it seems to me that 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 memory is a, a pleasant time for you. You're uh, you're playing. You're out. Get to go outside. You're all excited because your mother says either take a nap or go out and stay out. Right? And you're happy. You're going to go out and play. So my theory is that when uh, I ask someone what's their earliest memory, normally it's a very pleasant thing that they recall, or it could be a a, a, a trauma, a very bad experience early in their life, and those. Those are real good things and real bad things. Those are the things that stick in our minds over a lifetime. It's, it's the average day we forget. Right. So that's my theory. All right. Uh, now, do you have siblings? Yes. Yeah. You, you have a, now Daniel's married to your sister. No, I married one, one sister and he married the other sister of the Potts family. Oh, so, so, uh, uh, Daniel and your wife are sisters, but they're from a totally different family. Okay, so my, my wife and Daniel's wife are one family. 
They came yeah. from one family. Yeah. He got one. He picked one off. I picked one off right. from their family. Okay. I yeah. see. I get it now. I, I was a little confused how that worked, but, uh, um, but so how about your own uh, nuclear family? Do you have any siblings? Yes, I have an older brother. He is, uh, he's about a year and a half older than me. I have a younger brother. He is what, 24, 25. I have two sisters. Um, they're, one of them's close to my age, a few years younger than me, and one's about maybe four years younger than me. So a total of four. Four of you. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm assuming this, but it's not safe to assume this these days, but uh, you, uh, growing up, you had two parents at home? That was not a, not a divorce or a broken family? Just No, most of the time, my dad was not at home. It was just my mom taking care of us. Mm -hmm. Most of my childhood, I remember little bits and pieces of him being around, but not much. And what was the reason when he was gone? I, I think he just had some internal mental, like he couldn't handle, like, I, I, I think it has to do with forgiveness personally. You know how in relationships, a lot of times you'll have some problems arise and and if you can't find forgiveness for the other person, it's hard to function together. I mean, I don't really know. He never really told me, but he was just, I don't know. He couldn't stay home. He just was like outgoing and doing. I don't know if he was partying or what. I don't know. So, so he just wasn't around. Uh, growing up then, if, if he's gone much of the time, did he have uh, much of an uh, influence on you? You got uh, not really. I, I, I think you got it you turned on now, and I'm getting a feedback. So, whatever you turned on is uh, my words are being repeated. I haven't touched anything. Oh, okay, okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm everything I say is being uh, repeated back. Yeah, I don't but know. Matthias will fix it. Yeah, I think somehow he's, he's got the, uh, the live program turned on and it's uh, being played back for us now. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Is, is that better? Let me see. Uh, it's when I talk that's the problem. Okay. I, I can't hear him, Matthias. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't getting any feedback then, but uh, you can't hear me, huh? Okay, I'm I'm talking and I'm not nope. getting feedback. Nothing My words good. are not repeated. Can you hear me? Are you in the right spot? Are you in the headphones? Oops. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. All right, and I'm not see everything I was saying was being repeated. So, but you know, uh, some people say that I am so profound that uh, my words are worth repeating. So that's probably what was happening there. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Now, even by that little trick from the devil trying to throw us off, uh, I know exactly what we were talking about. Uh, I was wondering about your father and you and your relationship, and uh, he's gone much of the time. What kind of influence and impact did your father have on you as, as a boy growing up? Um, not really much. I was thinking back actually a few days ago, me and my brother were talking like what we actually learned from my father. And I can think of one thing I learned to go to work and be there on time. One thing like out of my life that he actually taught me. Wow. So that it, th there wasn't much. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, your father is probably my generation. Uh, I know with my father, um, uh, he was gone much, but because he was gone away uh, working on the railroad, he was gone a lot. Um, and, and I know that many, many people from my father's generation, they fathers weren't in, interested in putting all of this time into helping to raise the kids. They were the, the, the breadwinners and they're out working. And, and uh, that the way people see things differently is now where uh, it's, it's, it's more, um, 
there's an interest now in getting the both parents involved in raising the kids to a certain extent now. But uh, so your mother was the one that was there really doing most of the raising of you and your brother and two sisters. Uh, uh, well, your your mother, are both your both your parents still alive today? No, my father is dead. My mother is alive. Okay. Well, do you know if your father ever uh, came to faith? I don't think so. Oh. Just because he talked about that people were saved in the Old Testament by being water baptized. Oh. He that came from his lips. So. It's, it's concerning. Yeah. Well, that's a situation that many people have to uh, cope with. Uh, the, when they, uh, they lose a loved one, uh, the, the concern that they probably never really believed, and, uh, and that's, that's really uh, heartbreaking. But uh, what about your mother? Did uh, she have faith and, and teach it to you and it's your siblings? Well, I don't, I don't really know. She... She would be, I would be, she would take me to church a lot more than my dad. Of course, he wasn't there. We were in church a lot when we were younger. We went to Brother Matt Johnson's church, which is Faith Baptist here in Milton. He's since dead. And then, and then another church we went to is in Deland. It's called uh, Liberty Baptist Church, and it's Slade Rickles. That's the pastor. And she, we, she would always take me to church, like a lot. That's where I learned a lot of the basis of what I know today bits and pieces that the Lord used to bring me back to church. So she took me to church a lot, but I don't, we didn't have too many personal Bible studies between my family and all. What I learned, I learned from church. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, number 16 uh, in my series here on interviews. And uh, I don't recall, there might be one or two, I, I don't remember, uh, but I... I it doesn't seem that anybody was brought up with the uh, Bible instructions coming directly from their parents. Uh, if they did get something from their parents, it was not exactly right. And most of the time, the parents neglected it entirely and left it up to, well, I'll take them to church and they'll get it from the pastor. That was seemed to be the, the attitude. So your mother did faithfully uh, have you uh, and your brothers, brother and sisters uh, go to church. Yeah. Um, did, uh, did uh, how was uh, growing up? Uh, did you what? What kind of interests and things did you do as a, as a boy? Did you were you out uh, fooling around, getting into trouble all the time, or were you uh, one of those good boys that always went no. to class and studied and what? I was not a good boy. No. <laughs> well, usually the dad's there to like make sure stuff goes right. No, we were, man, we we. Used, we used to like, we had BB guns. We used to shoot birds and shoot yeah. windows and like hang out with other kids that shot birds and windows. And yeah, we just hung around the house. We, we brought, ride our bikes down to like the clay pits or to the, the train tracks, just whatever we could find to do. Hmm. I imagine shooting birds probably didn't get you in trouble, but shooting windows did. Did you get caught and get in trouble? Yeah, at one point we shot our neighbor's house. It was like ten feet from us. Oh, good. <laughs> Instead of way down the road, we were like shooting the neighbor's house. Yeah. Yeah. She took our guns, yeah. Wow. A few times. That exact same thing happened with my son when he was about maybe about uh I think around fourteen. Uh but it turns out I uh, see the neighbor, uh, the police came knocking on our door and wanted to question us because the neighbor behind us, their window was shot out with a BB. So my son and he had a friend staying, sp spending the, the night visiting him. And they came down and, and my son said that he did it. And, and we ended up having to make an agreement to pay for the repairs. And uh, but probably. 20 years later, my son told me that he didn't shoot the window. His friend did. He just took the blame for him, you know, because his, he said, he said, dad, I knew that you were not going to punish me too badly, but his father was horrible. And, and there's no telling what his father would have done. So I said that I shot the window, but that's interesting. I, we're, they're shooting windows, but not 
not out in the miles away, but right their next door neighbor, huh? Yeah. Wow. We weren't we weren't brilliant kids. You were not we're not just... mastermind criminals, were you? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so, what what other kind of interests and things did you do as a, as a boy growing up? Uh, we didn't do too much, but I mean, we were just at the house. We didn't we weren't involved in any sports or nothing. We would take our bikes and ride them down to the park sometimes, or we just hang out at our friend's house or. Not not too much. Mm -hmm. Interesting, anyway. Just just fooling around and trying to be, be creative. Like I remember, I used to have these little rubber soldiers, about you know, and, and two inches high maybe, and get, dig little canals and put water in there and get a popsicle stick and and and, and it used my imagination. Uh, is that the kind of thing that you were doing since you weren't playing sports? You had to use your imagination to entertain yourselves. When we were younger, we used to make little tracks with the cars, little matchbox cars. You drive them over the little bridge and stuff. But yeah, we were yeah we were getting into meanness as we got a bit older, though. As we got to be twelve or thirteen, yeah, we were into like tearing stuff up rather than playing. <laughs> oh wow! Right. So uh, as you're. Uh, as you're growing up and, and uh, with your brother and your two sisters there, uh, what were the relationships like with, with, with them? And, and is it uh, the, the, the good relationships today? Yeah. Well, yeah, relationships are good today. It's just we, we were so mean to our sisters. And they still love me to this day, man. I don't know why I was so mean to them. I don't know why I was so mean to them. But we used to terrorize them. We would hide their shoes. We would hide their shoes, their toys. And then we kept getting in trouble because we would hide both the shoes. And my mom said, my mom said, now two shoes don't come up missing every time something's missing. It's not both the shoes missing. So we started hiding one shoe. <laughs> and all we did is we'd open the attic. There's like this little thing to get into the attic. We would just throw one shoe up in there. I don't know why we did that. Hiding one of like all that. There was a pile of shoes up there after a few years. Was that one of the sisters or both? Both of them. We used to terrorize both of them. Yeah. And, and do they still hold that against you today or are they, uh, they moved on and not worried about that? They don't say nothing about it. And we're friends. So that's well, great. <laughs> I, um, I, I think that, uh, uh, an older brother to a sister, uh, part of his job as a brother is to tease him and antagonize him and play tricks on him like that. I, I had my sister, we tied her to a chair and put firecrackers in the chair and lit them off. And, oh, no. <laughs> and I got a vice, a, a, a vice you know, in a, in a work garage, you know, where you tighten things in the vice. Yeah. And I put her hand in the vice and tight, tighten it, tighten it down. But not, not to really hurt her, but just to, <laughs> just to scare her, you know. Yeah. yeah, she still remembers all those things, but we laugh about it because it wasn't really horrible. It was just having fun. Uh, at least it was fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so uh, let's get to the time where you're uh, you're not a kid anymore. You're you're beginning to be a, a grown up. And uh, what kind of uh, did you pursue uh, um, education, uh, vocation, or? Um, uh, any kind of a work career or anything? What what did you, direction did you go? Well, I, I dropped out of high school at 10th grade, like maybe halfway through 10th grade. Dropped out of high school and got my GED, the good enough diploma. I got that. I mean, I don't even, I, I've never even used it. I, I don't see what the point even is in it. So, and then from there, I went to, uh, for a while, I had a job washing dishes at a, like an old folks home. That was one of my first. No, my first job was at McDonald's. I worked there for three weeks. I got a check for $150 and I never went back. $150. I was like, what is this, man? So then I went and got that job washing dishes. I did that for uh, maybe a year. Then I got a job making subs at a place called Belly Busters in the land. They made like steak and cheese and your uh euros and stuff like that i worked there for maybe maybe two years 
I don't know, somewhere around 18 or 19, I started doing framing. You started building you know, framing, building houses, carpentry. Yeah. yeah. Now you're starting to talk, get into some, some money that is, uh, can actually support you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I started doing. I got in there for seven twenty five an hour is what I started at. So, and then I've been framing ever since I'm still framing. I, I was what, I think 18 when I got that job. So. Oh, so it's almost, it's almost 20 years now you've been in that profession. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, uh, what, what, what about interest in girls? Did you start getting interested in girls when you were a teenager and going through oh. junior high and high school? And did you get in that get you into, into any trouble? Not too much trouble. Um, yeah, we, I didn't have a job. Like I was like a bum when I was a kid mm -hmm. and I, 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 I didn't know several girls that I was interested in and some of them I talked to, some of them I didn't some of them weren't the best girls around and so i didn't really get hooked up too much into them one one of the girls I, I she was my girlfriend for like three years like at the most but it didn't really go anywhere so it was on and off it wasn't really that great it didn't get me anywhere good so mm -hmm. okay uh I'm uh, I'm reaching a point here pretty soon where uh, if, if there's a wife and children and and, 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 and when you uh, came to realize that that you're saved uh, when uh, when that happened I don't know what age those things happened but uh, I'm I'm going to assume that that was somewhere in this stage are are you married or uh, oh yeah you're yeah. married to the sister of Daniel's wife and when did yes. that happen. Um, I think it's like 14 years ago, 14 years ago. So that's, it at, might be 15. Uh, I don't know. 30 at, at uh, 23. So, uh, yeah, so you were, uh, you were well on your, in your career for framing houses and, and getting yourself, uh, established so you could support a wife and family. So then you get married and how about children? Did you have children right away or is that come later? No, no, I, I, I mean, I wanted a family, but it's kind of just kind of happened as we started going through married life. Uh, maybe about a year. Our first kid was probably a year after we got married, I would say would be close enough. Mm -hmm. So that would make them about 11 or 12 years old, that child. Uh, yeah. yeah. You have others? 11. Too? 11. Yeah, one child or more? Uh, we had, uh, we since had uh Jaden that's my daughter about two years after that she's about two years behind him a year and a half something like that so you've got one son and one daughter yeah about 11 and, about 11 and 9 and then and then and then, I, and then we have our youngest which is Eli he is two he's probably two and a half two boys oh. and one girl oh okay yeah Okay, so there's a gap there between two and number two and number three. Yeah, we were done at two. <laughs> <laughs> and now we got three. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say Eli is coming. <laughs> and I'm sure you're happy even though you didn't plan it. So you, you, com you combine salvation with me getting married. Is that like a joint effort or what is uh, that? <laughs> no, it's just that, that two big events in your life uh, that uh, I'm curious about when, when each happened. I, I'm so I was just assuming that at some point in this timeline of your life, that these things happened here. Uh, so now we know, and, and your, and your wife is, uh, uh, does she work outside of the home or is hey, uh, being your uh, wife and, and the mother uh, enough work for her? Oh yeah, it's enough work for her for sure. But she she does work. She works two days a week. Uh, she does hair. She does hair at the salon. It would be very easy to do your hair. Yeah, she cuts my hair. So if you see my beard growing long or my hair getting fluffy, she needs to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your hairstyle. I I pre I let mine grow until it's too long, and then I cut it short like yours. And then I let it grow until it gets too long again. Like I can comb it now, but when I finally cut it, it's going to be like yours. It just, it just saves a lot of time and effort that way. Yeah. Uh, 
All right. So yeah, you're raising a, you're married, uh, raising a family at some point, uh, you get interested in either church, the Bible, or you get uh, you come to the realization. I'm I'm saying it as a particular way because I I'm pretty sure that we agree that uh, you didn't make some decision to become a Christian, but you uh, you came to the realization at some point. You were convinced and well, you, realized that Jesus is your Savior. You're going to heaven. And uh, yeah, could, could you tell me that uh, uh, you know, when and how that came about? Okay, yeah. So you just are—are are you telling me my testimony, or am I telling you? You're telling me. I, I, I'm just kind of <laughs> setting it up. I think. Okay. All right. So I was in church. The Lord did some did some stuff with me concerning my girlfriend and me going to jail and stuff to get me back in church. This was long before I met my wife. Oh, okay. So I was in church at Slade Rickles Church, I, I know that those people cared about me, and that's how I got back in church. I, I kind of ditched my all my friends, mm -hmm. and I, I started going back to church where the people cared about me. So that's the Lord working in my life, getting me back to church. Yeah. And so from there, I met my wife. She came down to visit my church from her church, which is in this town. Mm -hmm. And so she was like singing and playing the piano, and I was like in love. Mm. like at first sight and somehow we got married <laughs> so oh. so ba basically i chased her up here and so i ended up moving up here for her that's what got me back to milton i was living in the land yeah so you know, I you know, what, they, you know what they call that today they what? call that stalking <laughs> <laughs> no she was okay with it <laughs> okay i'm just kidding yeah. Uh, sometimes I uh, make a great effort uh, uh, to be funny, but it usually fails. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you're going to church because of friendship, uh, not because yeah. of your great interest in Jesus and heaven. Right. But, uh, but uh, you're, that's how you meet your wife. What uh, do you think your wife was saved when you first met her? No, she was. When I first met her, she was 17. Okay. Yeah, I don't so, think so. And what's the age difference between you? About six years? Um. Uh, yeah, I think five five years, something yeah. like that. It might be six, something yeah, like that. Doing the, trying to do the math as I keep up with all your these things, uh, these events. Yes. So I met my wife, and then I followed her up here. And when I followed her up here, I, I, I started going to church where she went to church. And the Lord used me coming up here to teach me about his word. Like I was pursuing her, mm -hmm. but he was teaching me his word. He had something more than just my wife for me. And he well, led me. Why, up here. why, why in the world, since you were coming up here, not of your great desire to, to meet Jesus and, and learn the Bible, but uh, you, you came up here because you, you were smitten with your wife and, and, and uh, what in the world made you go look at the Bible? Well, I had already, when I was going back to my other church, which preaches the truth, I was already going there and learning about, and I had already known about like people that are lost, they go to hell when they die. Mm -hmm. And that salvation's in Christ and the work. Of, I had been taught all that as a child. Mm -hmm. So that's already still in my mind. And before I even met my wife, I quit going to church on Wednesday night and I was just going Sunday morning, Sunday night. And then after a while, I quit going on Sunday night and I was just going on Sunday morning. And I contemplated when, uh, why don't I just not go to church at all? And then I thought, well, then when am I going to come back to church? And if I don't come back to church, when am I going to trust Christ? So the Lord had already been working in my mind to use that to keep me at church before she even came into the picture. But he brought me up here and used uh, Eddie Potts in a big way to teach me the word and me getting in and studying. I learned a lot of stuff from like 0.01% to like 100%. Mm -hmm. In a few years, God taught me a lot of things. And so, so go the ahead. Church, the church with your wife, well, the, the previous church to that, uh, you said they taught the truth? Yes. How many churches up there are, are are teaching the true gospel? Like one that I know of. Now, I don't go visit every church, 
but like these are the two churches that I know of. I don't go visit every church, but I know there's a bunch of garbage being taught. I know the that church, the church that you when you move to be with your wife, that new church, where, uh, do they also teach the truth? Yes. So you yeah. happen to find you happen to find two churches teaching the, the true gospel. That yeah, that's the Lord. Yeah, I would say so because the odds <laughs> are very <laughs> low. That are so low, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Ah, she can might travel across an entire state, and it's hard to find a couple. Wow. So uh, now you, you're mentioning Eddie Potts. Uh, I'm not sure who he is, uh, but uh, in this church and uh, instruction, uh, did you have a great desire at this point to to learn the Bible, or were you just attending out of obligation and you were you started and then it developed? an interest or how that yeah. so I was attending to be with her every time I would go over to her house in the evenings mm. and every Bible study, every time I could get near her, I was. Mm. So that led me to like all the Bible studies. They were doing one on for a while there, they were doing a Bible college on Monday night, Tuesday night. They had a Bible study Wednesday night. They had church Thursday and Friday and Saturday were off. And then Sunday church morning, and evening. So it was a lot of church. Yeah. And so through that, the Lord got my attention on the word of God and was using the preaching, the teaching to get me to start studying and seeking out my own salvation because he used the fact that uh, it wasn't going good. Us getting together concerning the parents, like they weren't having it. So we started kind of getting separated and the Lord used, that to show me that I needed him, not Megan. I needed him, not the woman I was seeking after. Because what if she, what if she goes away for some reason? What if God takes her away? Then what do I got? Nothing. So he used that to get me in the word to start seeking. And then from there, he started giving me a desire to learn these different things. And also the pastor, he, he said, Hey, I want you to teach, uh, teach uh, this this class on Wednesday night or something. Come preach for like 10 minutes. And I was like, what? <laughs> preach for 10 minutes? I'm like, what am I going to say? Oh. So what happened is I'm in here digging like, what am I going to yeah. say? What am I going to tell these people? Like, I don't know nothing, man. I got to find something. And so I spent a lot of time in like, John and Romans and Hebrews, like my pages of my old Bible are all dirty on those pages. All, yeah. Like I was all through there. God taught me a lot of things. Yeah. Well, you, you just said my favorite books. I've always steer everybody, John and then Romans, Galatians and Hebrews. Those are my favorite books. I think that's the, that's the heart. If all you had were those, you'd be still in very good shape. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so you... Uh, and those books, of course, um, uh, John uh, it, it focus first on uh, the identity of Jesus, know, learning who he is exactly. And then uh, it's also about how to get saved. And that's what uh, Romans, Hebrews, and Galatians are, are also about this uh, no works salvation. Uh, did you have an interest in those so much because you it was re, you were coming to the realization that working for salvation was not not the uh, a way of gaining it i i've always known from my mom had me in brother matt johnson's church when i was a child and slade rickles so i never thought works got you anywhere it was just taught ingrained into me that works are garbage and Jesus did the work. Like I already knew that part. Yeah, wow. So I didn't have to overcome that part. I just had to see who I was and that I was the wicked one and I needed the Lord. I couldn't fix none of this. Up. I couldn't even study the word. I couldn't even pick up the Bible and study. Have you, have you seen my testimony on talking doctrine? No, I didn't oh. want to watch it. I, I don't, didn't want to watch it too. Oh, then you have all the answers. <laughs> this interview here. So I want to get this oh. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happened is I was laying there in at night one night after I went and hung out with my wife or then she was my girlfriend. So I saw the Bible laying over there on the table and I, I was tired. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And I, and I was like, Oh, there's the Bible. I need to read that. I need to be learning every chance I get. 
And I'm like, I need to get up and get the Bible to read it. And I'm just laying there. And I, I didn't have the will to get up. Yet I just spent all this time going to hang out with my wife. And God kind of showed me that night that my priorities were backwards. I should be pursuing what he wants. And so I asked the Lord, give me strength to get up and get my Bible and even read it. Like, I'm not going to understand any of this stuff if you don't give me some strength to even seek. Mm -hmm. So that was er that was kind of early you, on. When you say that the Lord showed you something, uh, could you tell me how that was communicated to you? It was, it was just me talking in my mind to the Lord. Lord, I, I need to get the Bible. That's, that's just a thought that come across my mind, okay, like an impression. And so I'm like, yeah, I do need to get it. So how do I get it? And, I, and I'm just seeing myself still laying there. Like, why ain't I getting up and grabbing the Bible and reading? And it's like the Lord basically revealed to me just to my mind an understanding that you don't care about my word. You know how he, he gives you, the, the thought comes across your mind. That didn't come from me because yeah. I like myself. I think I'm something grand, you know, <laughs> that didn't come from me, you know. So I asked the Lord, hey, you need something. You have not because you ask not. Lord, help me read my Bible. Just at least get it up, pick it up and start reading it. Give me at least that. And through that, I learned to when I need knowledge, Lord, give me knowledge. Now you got me in the word. Give me some more. Yeah. But this this happened after you've already been received uh, a much uh, uh, teaching from the churches. Yes, I got the majority of the teaching. Um, it was like the teaching from the current church when when I was back when I was learning. It was more condensed. Like some churches, you might get a, a few little pieces of truth out of a whole message, but this church, when I was learning, God was jumping it on me. I mean, just blasted with it. Every message. It wasn't like you're going to, you got to search for a few pieces. It was just like an overload and God just kept dumping it and kept dumping it on me. Mm -hmm. hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, the thing is I find so interesting and, 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 uh, it's sad to say this, but it's even unique because it, it's a kind of thing that uh, should, I'd like to see it as a common occurrence, but your experience was never that works are a means of salvation. Yeah, not and at all. Almost everybody I've ever encountered my life when I growing up uh, in the Roman Catholic and, 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 and just the, the indoctrination of the worldview is that everything's personal merit. You know, you, it'll, we'll be judged about how good we are. And, and almost everybody I've ever met has gone through a period in their life where they think that, that uh, the, the salvation is something to be earned through your behavior and your, and uh, you know, you, God has to, you know, uh, you have to make yourself acceptable to God and, and hope, hopefully you've done well enough and he accepts you. That's the norm. Almost everybody believes that and that you never had to experience that. That's a wonderful thing that you never had to overcome that. Well, I did. Well, yeah, that's how I, that's how I was taught. So, you know, a lot of things you taught, you're taught like those people you're mentioning, they were taught that works had something to do with it. So that's probably why they lean that direction. I was taught that works didn't have nothing to do with it. But also, but also in my own mind, I was thinking that I was doing something to gain favor with God. And God revealed that to me through my old pastor, Slade Rickles. I just mentioned it on fr the Fundamental Friday. But what happened is I went to a mission conference. I drove 400 miles down to South Florida where I came from. And I went to a mission conference and I asked him for, to, for some time to speak. So he gave me about five minutes to say something. So I got up there and I, I remember mentioning, let God be true and every man a liar. But I, don't, I didn't say nothing about the blood and Calvary and reconciliation. I missed it. And then I sat back down. He got up behind me, the pastor, Pastor Slade Rickles. And he said, 
They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I thought he was talking about everybody else, all the other missionaries that didn't have it right. Wow. And I said, amen, brother, in the back of the church. You know what he said? That's you, David. Yeah. Wow. That's man. you, David, in the middle of mission conference. Man. I was like, okay, I hear you, Lord. Is that me? Then, then the thought came across my mind. My heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I was like, is that, that's, that might be me, Lord. If that is me, please show me that that's me. Uh, when, when was that? When did this happen? Oh, um, maybe a year before I trusted him, which is about, I, I trusted the Lord about three months before I got married which was about 15 years ago. So let's say 16 and a half years ago, something like that. That's the mission conference thing. Mm -hmm. And so you hadn't come to saving faith and yet you wanted to go speak to this, this uh, group. Yeah. Cause they, they didn't have it either, but I didn't know that I was had the problem. He said, that's you, David. So I, I, I could have went two ways right there. Oh, you yeah. don't know what you're talking about. You, I know these scriptures I've been preaching. I've learned all this. Mm -hmm. Or, God, is this right? There's two routes, and it's a big deal which route you take. Yeah. And so I, by the grace of God, went the route. My heart is deceitful. I don't know my own heart, Lord. Show me. Yeah. So that that was just, that was kind of a turning moment in my life. There's There's a few major things that the Lord has done to guide me to truth. That's one of them. Well, your scripture, uh, zeal without knowledge, uh, not according to knowledge, is uh, a scripture that uh, all my experiences um, in uh, uh, street preaching, then in uh, this YouTube ministry, uh, that is something that has been a glaring a problem. Uh, I encounter so many people, they have this zeal. Some young men, a lot of young people, they get they, they, they either get saved or they think they, they're saved. And very soon after, they've got all this zeal, but they don't have the knowledge yet. And sometimes they're even absolutely wrong about salvation, but they're full of zeal. And uh, I, 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 in one hand, I um, hesitate to bring it up. Because I don't want people to think that, hey, you need to respect your elders. Uh, I'm older and I know more than you. That I don't want that to be the, the theme. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to say. But I do see that this, there's a serious problem with a lot of young people that they're full of zeal, but they haven't, don't have the years of study to get the knowledge right. And, and it's, uh, it's out of control and creating a problem. I, I had to leave a street preacher organization. Uh, uh, the leader, uh, he and I just uh, disagreed on this premise. I said almost all the street preachers are preaching a false gospel. And he says, well, at least they're doing something. Oh, most Christians, most Christians are not doing anything. At least they're doing something. And I said, I would rather have them sitting on their hands doing nothing than doing something wrong. And, and they're doing harm. They're not doing any good. So uh, that's why uh, I, I, I see this. Uh, when you say that, it, it kind of gets me all excited to zeal without knowledge. And we encounter a lot of people here in talking doctrine and my, my ministry, too, that, that we deal with this a lot where people want to come on and start teaching too soon, mm -hmm. too soon. Wait, get to get, you know, that we, James says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. But the, the default for people is opposite. Be, be quick to speak, quick to anger and slow to listen. That's the, no, that's the norm <laughs> for humans. Um, all right. Now I want to know, uh, okay. Uh, this, um, uh, this feeding you've been getting from the church and the pastors all this time, you have two really good churches and they're teaching you and then you and you're, you go out and start teaching, but you still don't have it right. What was missing? Okay. So the Lord taught me through, through my wife and the separation that we had while we were still trying to get married, the separation that I could trust him even with her. And, and he put that separation and it's like, he wanted, me to come to a point 
to where I said, Lord, if you have to take her away for me to understand truth, so be it. And I, I thought that thought that I should ask the Lord to give me understanding, even if he has to take away um, my girlfriend at the time for me to get understanding. But I wouldn't pray it. I thought that I should, but then I wouldn't say it because I wanted her. Mm -hmm. And so after the Lord kept working on me and kept dealing with me after a while, yeah, I got to the point where I'm like, OK, so salvation is much more important, important. She could die like tomorrow. And then what do I got? Yeah. salvation lasts forever, you know, so I should be pursuing the Lord. And then I come to the point where I said, Lord, if you need to take her away and us not be together, not be married, whatever, if that's what you need to do for me to understand truth, I'm willing. Like God got me to that point, working with me, teaching me and me learning that that was actually way more important. And was that the point you're going through uh, John, Romans, Galatians and Hebrews? Um, kind of, we, I had a, I had a Bible study with one of my cousins and so I kind of started the Bible study up. So of course I got to find something for these people. So that those different Bible studies and the pastor wanting me to speak at church sometimes that led me in the word more and more and more. Cause I got to find something for these people. Like I don't, I don't have too much. To, what am I going to tell them? Like these people have been going to church way longer. Than, like, what am I going to tell them? I'm new here. So I had to dig and find a lot of these things. And through that, the Lord, uh, he just he just been dealing with my heart and then just teaching me more and more. This this Bible, it takes a, a while for God to teach you. I'm still like today. I'm still learning. Like I learn stuff every day from his word, but enough to understand Christ. It takes some learning from the scriptures. God has to put these wires together and organize it in your mind where you actually understand what he's talking about when he talks rather than like a, the parable he speaks to people because you're, you're not listening or you can't hear so you don't understand it you, god had to put these things together so the when i when i finally come to the realization it was an evening in brother terry sanders he's like a revival preacher type he would come around to different churches preaching for like three or four days straight. And then he'll go to another one. It's like a revival type thing. And so I was in the sound booth. Just, I think I was recording or something. I don't really remember what I was doing up there, but he was there. And I remember the Lord just revealing to me. And before this time, I was trying to believe it. I would, I would read that to him that believeth. And then I'm like, okay, so I got to believe it. <laughs> Lord, I'm believing it, you know, I'm believing it. And then I'm like waiting for something to happen. And there's like nothing happening. I'm just like, I'm still David sitting in a room with the Bible. You know, there's no difference. And so the Lord revealed to me before I trusted him that you don't believe me. And then I was thinking about the thought that he gave me in my mind. And I agreed with him. I don't believe, I really don't believe you because you, you're telling me that I'm washed already. You've already washed me. I don't believe, I don't believe you, God. So then I quit trying to believe it. I totally quit. And then, so what, I, what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm just reading now. Instead of trying to make it happen, I'm just reading. Lord, I'm missing something. Show me, show me what I'm missing. You know, I don't even know what I'm looking for. I keep reading the blood and the cross, but I mean, that, that doesn't mean anything for me. Like it's not helping me. And so, so I just quit trying to believe it. And then, so then when I was at the service in the sound booth, the guy was preaching, um, Terry Sanders and it, the Lord just revealed it to me. He opened my understanding that it's already done. He has already washed me. He's not waiting on me. He's not waiting on something else. He already washed me with his own blood. And I was like, oh, well, duh, you idiot. Like, how did you miss that? You know, it's so obvious and it's so simple. How did I miss that? And just God, God, God just gave me the understanding. And so yeah. now, so now I just know that that's so. He already washed me in his blood. He can't reject me. He accepts me. He's my father because the work, he already did the work. He's paid for my sins. And there's nothing to do. Absolutely nothing. It's already washed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Wow. Well, 
I, I've been uh, talking about uh, Jesus and the gospel now for 32 years. And from the beginning to present, the language I use, the, the format has modified a little bit here and there. Choice of words is a little bit different. But only recently did I um, realize that uh, the word realize is, is uh, the right way, I think, for me to make the point that, that a person needs to come to the realization, that you came to that realization. Uh, and you can't force yourself to do it. Um, but until you realize that it is done and, and it applies to you, and, and, and when you realize it, this is where I get myself. I don't think I'm getting in trouble, but there's a potential problem here. And that is that uh, I say the, the expected reaction, I, would, I say the expected reaction when a person comes to the realiza realization is jumping for joy. When you realize that I'm promised heaven, it's guaranteed nothing's gonna change it, thank you, Jesus. The response should be, we're so happy and full of joy and peace and blessed assurance. And, but when I say that, I know that I'm also flirting with the problem of imposing a reaction on everybody universally, like everybody must have this emotional response to prove they're really saved. And I don't want to do that. But also I question, why wouldn't anybody react that way? If they really have come to the realization that it's done and they, it's assured, nothing can change it. It's irrevocable, irreversible and, and heaven. Um, so that's the word realization, I think, is a, a new word that I'm, I'm just adopted in this gospel message. That I, I think in, that uh, that's, that's what has to happen. That was what was missing with you, is that you had not yet come to the realization. Matthias and I were talking in one of these discussions recently, and he used this parable of the uh, treasure, searching for the treasure in the field, and when you uh, uh, discover it, and that's coming to the realization, I, okay, I've got it. And so that was a good picture of it. But uh, that's how I would uh, uh, express what, what we go through when we believe. But, uh, okay, so I asked you what was missing, and you said, well, you just, you realize that it already was done and it applied to you personally. All right. Uh, what, what more do you want to tell us about, about that, if anything, about this... Uh, experience that you you had there, you know we know that salvation is not a process it's an event uh, at a particular moment in time you realize it okay what happened next oh well i went down and told everybody i was calling people letting people know that i trusted the lord and why that it was the work that was already done so i remember calling several people and letting them know that because i think people had been praying for me and I don't know who's praying. Somebody's praying. Like I'm understanding truth. Somebody's been praying for me. So I was calling people, letting people know that I trusted the Lord so they could have some relief, you know. And that was it. Still still learning, still teaching, preaching. Mm -hmm. Well, the my observations of you uh, over the last few weeks uh, is that uh, you, you have zeal, and you have knowledge and the truth. And uh, and be, this personality that I see in you, I like. I think a lot of people like this kind of enthusiasm. Uh, but uh, I think that is a, kind of an example of what I was, the point I was trying to make, is that this is the response that you have enthusiasm. I mean, how could you not have enthusiasm and be excited? When you talk, you're excited because you have this blessed assurance. That's how I uh, see uh, when I, what I see when I uh, observe you and, and what you're doing. And, yeah, and, well, it, and it blesses my heart that God uses me. Like, I'm not worth using, but he actually uses me. And that's, that's just amazing that he does that. From where I came from, not that I'm something great now, but I was just going the wrong direction 
hanging out with my buddies, doing drugs and stuff. And God brought me all the way back to understanding his truth. And then he gives me an opportunity to speak to others concerning his message. That's I don't deserve that. And so I'm honored that God would do that. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me, I, I, I'm, I'm one that believes and teaches that uh, every person when they're born again, not only becomes a child of God, but becomes a minister, a servant. And we're all called to serve in some way. Of course, Paul says that as a body, we have many parts. We're not all supposed to be doing the same thing. That would be redundant. But I think a person uh, should, after they uh, realize that they have this great salvation, uh, they should uh, start asking the Lord to reveal to them how they fit into the body. What is how, uh, how does God want to use them? What's their ministry? How can they serve? Uh, did you uh, uh, seek the, in it, that, or did you know how you wanted to serve and begin doing it at that time, or, or what happened? No, before? no, I was still just learning, just like before I was saved. I was still just coming to church, learning more and more about the Lord. But I could see the Lord in different situations. The Lord brought me through some different situations in my life, which was kind of hard to deal with. And teaching me, even after I was saved, to trust him in these other big areas. And I didn't I didn't yield to him. If I had a yielded sooner, I would have got out of it sooner. But I, I was being stubborn. And, you know, God knows how to deal with you. But he's done several different things, like kind of getting me, kind of straightening me out, if you will. Before he released me on you guys, probably, <laughs> that's probably what he was doing. He's done a lot of work in my life to guide me to where I could be beneficial. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know what he was doing and I could see him preparing me for something. I could see it bit by bit, him putting things together and teaching me things, preparing me for something. I just had no idea what it was, but I, I would just, every, I don't know, a few maybe once a week or once every two weeks, I would be preaching in the church like for Wednesday night or something, but continually doing that kind of stuff, just no real ministry, just kind of whenever the pastor needed me, I would be there. Mm -hmm. So you began making yourself available uh, and you didn't have a conscious thought or a decision about, uh, okay, I need to get involved in some kind of ministry and serve the church somehow. You just, were available when needed and what 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 did you do now between between talk and doctrine and you coming onto the scene here because the 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 talk and doctrine programs and my programs church of the eternally secure the people who are participating i i, I call them our congregation and, and b before you became uh aware of and, and uh, became part of this congregation do you uh in the time you believed, what kind of uh, works have you done uh, in, in terms of any kind of ministry? You, you'd made yourself available and you occasionally preached, but was there anything else that you decided you wanted to focus on you, uh, you're doing or, or you just? I don't know. I, I, I was always leaving it up to the Lord. Like, where do you want me? Because well, we would sometimes we would go like around visiting, which we don't really do that much anymore because people, they don't even want you at their house knocking on their door, visiting them. But we would do different things, but that was the church. Like I never really felt drawn to like a certain ministry. Like different people in our church have different ministry, but I never felt drawn. I never really knew what I, I know I wanted to preach and teach what I knew and I knew that God wanted me to, I just didn't have a direction of where to. And it, it's been a while in that case. And maybe it was just the Lord getting me through certain things, preparing me, getting me ready for what he wanted me to do, you know? So I, I don't know, just kind of drifting kind of. Yeah. Now I think what you've just said there uh, is a good illustration of the point I was trying to make is, Sometimes people get big and they're all this deal and they want to rush out and start doing things, but they're not prepared. You didn't do that. You were made yourself available. Uh, use me, help, you know, I'm available to help whatever I can, but you weren't on a mission to go out and just start working real hard in some ministry and preaching and stuff. And you waited. And, and while you're waiting, 
you're becoming more and more prepared, getting the knowledge that you needed. So yeah. I think that's uh, that's wonderful. Uh, and you certainly are full of knowledge uh, now. Um, so when did you uh, when did you first uh, become aware of the of the talk and doctrine program and, and, and what uh, you know Matthias and we are all doing here? Yeah, so I wasn't too aware of it um, until it showed up at the church. They started broadcasting the church. Oh, I've yeah. heard bits and pieces about it before then, but I, I didn't know who I didn't know who it was, how to get on there, or I've never watched any of the videos or any of that stuff. I think my testimony is the first time that I had seen Matthias in some time. I saw him a while ago, but when he was visiting our church, I wasn't there at the time. I was going through some problems with my family, and I I didn't go to church for like probably. Well, you, you met you met Matthias previously, but you didn't really get to know him much then. Right, just his name basically. Yeah. That's about and it. So from uh, from Brother Daniel, uh, of course, you're connected there uh, through the marriage, and uh, I'm sure you you know Daniel very well. Yeah, uh, and then Daniel somehow uh, probably assisted in getting you involved with uh, Matthias and talking doctrine. Uh, and the idea of you uh, doing this uh, Friday program, um, how did that come about? Well, Matthias, he, I came over to do the testimony thing. I did that. And then he, he had asked if, or he had said, mentioned something about maybe coming, doing something more regularly, or we'll be hearing from David again, or maybe we will. Or, and then I, I came over, I don't know, a few weeks later, but I, I, I've, I've learned not to be pushy and trying to set yourself up in the scriptures. God sets people up. Mm -hmm. You, the people that try to set themselves up, they go down. God sets up these different people. Saul, David, you had Adonijah try to take Solomon, take a spot from Solomon. God said, no, that Solomon's going to be king, mm -hmm. you know, and God just Absalom tried to take it from David. God throws these people down. So I wasn't being pushy. He kept at, uh, he kept asking me to come back on or, and then, so I told him, look, I, I, I can do something maybe once or twice a week. And he was like, yes. I was like, okay, well, he obviously wants me to. So that's not me making something happen. I, I made sure to give him some time in, in case he was just being nice, you know, cause some people are just nice. And I, I make sure they ask again, then they're actually yeah. being genuine. So I don't really know him. I know him better now, but I didn't really know him. So I didn't, I didn't want to force myself into anything. If God don't build the house, they labor in vain, and then that build it. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach I took. And then I had mentioned, he had asked me again to come over again or something. So I said, I, I could do probably a, like a night or two a week if you want. And he said, yeah, that'll be great. And then he just, I didn't know he was going to set me my own show up. I thought I was just going to be coming and being part of another show or something. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I like having my own spot. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, what comes to my mind is uh, Jesus talking about the, the, uh, you come into the, the, the banquet or I think it's the banquet or it may be the congregation and you sit at the front and then you're asked to, that's not your spot go to the back versus someone who sits at the back and with humility and then they're brought up to the yeah. front. And so that's what's happened. You, you weren't trying to push yourself and impose yourself into get a, some kind of a, uh, attention and, uh, for everybody to watch and listen to you, uh, but it, it by being there and being available, that's the wonderful thing to always say, Lord, I'm available. I'll be available. Use me, but I'm not going to try to make it happen because then it, it, it might not be the right thing if I'm trying to create it and for, force it, but if I wait, uh, then it's God's will. Uh, so, no, you Matthias probably told you that uh, probably about three months ago, after about approximately one year of study contemplation, uh, I changed my mind about the 
our reality. And, and I, like you, believe that we have a flat, stationary, dome-covered Earth. Right. It took me a year of watching videos almost every day for a year and, and fighting it and resisting it and gradually being won over. And it's a subject that I don't talk about a lot, and I'm, I'm very conflicted because I feel like it's very important. And it's really, uh, it, it is revolutionary. It could really, I, I know it already has a huge impact in some people who are atheists or you know, just unbelievers. And, and that uh, this is the thing that, that uh, got them into the Bible. And so I think there's a great value in, in, in uh, teaching it and, and, and um, making people understand this. And, and yet, on the other hand, everybody says, don't talk about that. Just focus on the gospel. And I do, but, you know, on our program, I don't know if you've seen it on Sundays, but we, we have questions come in through the week from the congregation. And we have a group discussion taking turns asking the questions that came in. And we take questions on any subject. So it's not like we're we're only going to talk about the gospel and the, you know the the identity of Jesus and the means of salvation. That's the most important thing, but the whole Bible is important and interesting. And so we're talking about anything, and uh, I I don't want to feel like I have to avoid any particular subjects because people are saying, oh, that's too controversial or you're going to lose credibility or anything. But I, so I'm happy that uh, you're on that Friday program and, and you're, uh, I think from what I understand, uh, you're, the foundation of it will be this uh, flat stationary earth uh, uh, concept. But obviously you're going to talk about anything if, if necessary. But I'm glad yeah. that you're focusing on it. And I, I have a guilty complex because I'm, I'm cowering away from it and not, and not participating as much as I, I would like to. <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah, so I, I, let me say something. I've, stu I've studied the flat earth thing. Just before I got in the Bible, I did watch several videos to where I thought, okay, so there's more to this. This, this, because I thought it was crazy the first time I heard it. I was looking at them like, it's, the earth is flat, what? Like I thought they were crazy like instantly, but I had no idea. I had no information on the matter except what I was taught in school. And the major problem with the two different models is one of them is godless. That's the problem. It's godless. Yeah. That's, but yet everything else is set up. All these other planets are named after gods and all our children can recite every one of these other gods but you never told them where God is, the actual God who created. You're talking about creation, yet you're saying it just boom and it just happened, but there is no God. That's the main problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I first heard from uh, another brother, uh, Jason Jack, uh, that he believed flat uh, stationary earth and I, I didn't, hadn't known him that long, but I was quite impressed with him. I, he's very educated, very intelligent, very articulate, and yet he believes such a thing. I was blown away by it. But my reaction was not, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to contrast this with the reaction I have here with my wife. Because <laughs> we, the two of us have been fighting about this all day. Um, my reaction with Jason Jack and with... Um, uh, Matthias and Daniel, when I hear these things, is, well, I, I didn't say it, but I'm thinking, God, how could they believe such a thing? It's, it's, that's foolish. That's crazy. That's just, a, that's the normal reaction we all have. Uh, but I don't want to offend them, so I'm, I'm trying to be polite about it. But, but I also have great curiosity. I've gotten to know them well enough that I admire them. And I think that they're very intelligent. And yet they come to this conclusion so my reaction was not, okay, I'm going to refuse to look into it because it's too absurd. I'm just going to mock, mock it and ridicule it. That's the reaction I have from my own wife. <laughs> She's just like mocking and ridiculing me all day over this, you know. And, uh, uh, but I wish that when people did uh, 
in within the church, many of the people are giving us the right reaction, I think. And, and that is what the, the uh, proverb says, uh, to answer without before listening is folly. I'm yeah, paraphrasing. A shame unto them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the people are going to judge, judge your, you say it, they judge it without even hearing it out or learning. Until you're willing yeah. to learn it out, learn about it and hear it, give a fair hearing, you shouldn't be making any judgments because you're really judging out of ignorance. Yeah, that's so, what I was doing. So my attitude was, okay, I'm going to learn about it. And obviously I wanted to, thinking I would learn about it and uh, be able to refute it and poke holes in it and stuff, but I wasn't able to and eventually was won over to the other side. But my wife and so many other people, their reaction is not that, oh, I'm curious, how could... I mean, I've known my husband for, uh, you know, 40 years. And uh, I think she thinks I'm pretty intelligent. And <laughs> instead of thinking, well, he's pretty smart. If he came to that conclusion, maybe there's something to it. I think I'll, I'll, I'll look at it and consider it and see why. But no, you're crazy. You're, you're nuts. Are you in a cult now or something? Yeah, so, some people don't have the desire to even learn. And I think some people don't want to learn because they might have to tell somebody that it is actually flat and they're not ready to do that. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Two days ago, my wife somehow let it out, let the cat out of the bag to my son. And I have purposely been not telling my son about this belief I have. Uh, because I didn't want him to have to go through this. I didn't want him to think, oh, shocked. He's shocked. He can't believe it. Something wrong. I got to help him. I got to convert him. I got to show him. And, and then if he does go down that road, if he goes down that road as I did and you did and others have, where we're going to say, okay, well, I'll show you how you're wrong. What happens if he ends up believing as we do? And then he's got a career. And he's going to be forced in his career, he would have to keep his mouth shut because if he dared say, express this viewpoint publicly, he'd probably lose his job because they would say, he's a quack. We can't take him seriously. And I didn't want my son to be in the position where he's going to, okay, now he's finally, he, he looked at it, trying to prove me wrong. And now he, under, he believes as we do. And yet he's, if he, if he says it publicly, there's consequences. If he doesn't say it publicly, it's not being completely dishonest about who you are. And so that's that's the dilemma. But my wife let the cat out of the bag and, and I got quite upset that she let him know. But now I'm I am gonna have to deal with this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay, brother. So I guess goals uh, from this day forward, what is it you you would like to accomplish uh, within this uh, uh, the, the the format that you have available to, and also anything else you have in mind for uh, future ministry work. Just, I, I want people to understand the Lord and the truth and what has been done for them. That's the main thing. Flat earth is not the main thing. It's just part of it. And it's hard to interpret script, scriptures the correct way. If you think that we're on that ball, there's so many scriptures that that ball mixes up it calling good evil and evil good. God is up. Satan's down. And when you spin it, that's that those things start changing. Yeah. Now you're now. Now God is below Satan or you're above God. No, you're no one's ever above God. He stays at the top. Satan's cast down, down into the pit. You know, he's down below us. And so that's just part of it. I want to get it out there. There's so many scriptures on the matter. And it's, you can't interpret scriptures properly if you think that we live on that ball. It's just, it's mixed up. It's a mess. It doesn't add up. Like when the Lord comes back in Revelation uh, 1, where he says, 1, 7, I think it is, where every eye shall see him. Every eye sees the Lord. How are you doing that? If he comes back on this side of the world and you're on the other side, you ain't going to see him. No, he's coming back in the clouds straight down, just like he went up when the, the two 
when, when he went out, I think it's in Acts, mm -hmm. he went up and they were standing there looking into heaven. He went through the clouds and the, the two angels said, hey, why are you standing there looking up into heaven? He's going to come back that same way back through the clouds. You know, God didn't make creation and then move billions of miles away. No, he's right here with us. He's right above us. And so I, I want to get that out. Number one is the gospel, though. You can know that the earth is flat. And if you miss the gospel, I failed. Mm -hmm. You know, I want people to understand and rest in what Christ has done for them. Let, I want them to experience the rest that I have, the peace yeah. of mind when you go to bed or you get in your car and you're driving down the street. You can have a head on collision. And when you check out, you're going to be with the Lord. That is an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want people to understand that every last one. If if I'm on here for years and one person understands that, that's all. I think that's great. And I think that's what God wants me to do. Now, I don't know where God's going to lead me. I've tried to follow as best I can. And right here now he's got this set up on Fridays. I can see it. My family, I've been wondering how am I going to get down to my family in South Florida and give them the gospel? Well, here's an answer. My mom lives in South Florida. I want her to hear the gospel. Different people, like whoever around the world, I can send them the link. They can hear the gospel from Milton, Florida. Mm -hmm. God set this up here. I don't know where he's leading, but I'm going to try to follow best I can. Yeah, that is the wonderful thing. And, and this is... Uh, um, when I was street preaching, eventually I had to get into a wheelchair because of health problems, and, and I was preaching from a wheelchair. Uh, and then uh, eventually, uh, uh, when I got on YouTube, I I transitioned from the street preaching over to this. It, it was kind of a, a mix of both initially, and but I finally went over completely to uh, this because it's just it's so much easier. Uh, uh, considering the condition of what I was dealing with, it was just a very, very difficult and, and hard. This was easy. But also, um, we have such an opportunity to reach people everywhere. Uh, we, we've, got, uh, we've got saints here in our congregation from uh, Chile and uh, you know, Canada and Europe and uh, everywhere, all over the United States and uh, Australia. And, and this this. Obviously, the internet is used for a lot of evil, but it also can be used for great good and, and the gospel, spreading the gospel. So uh, this is a great tool, and shame on us if we're not taking full advantage of it uh, for the glory of Jesus. I, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you uh, uh, contributing uh, on Talking Doctrine, and... Uh, all right. Um, I think that we're we got through your uh, your birth to present day pretty pretty thoroughly. Uh, is there anything that, as we went through your life's experiences, uh, that uh, I didn't ask you about that you think you'd like to share, or anything you want to talk about even in, in, any further? Childhood was pretty uneventful. Nothing too amazing happened, but I I made it through it, so that that's great. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's that's it's not that eventful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay, and uh, obviously, getting to know people's uh, life experience can be helpful to understand, you know, how they became the person they are today, and understand better who they are, because a lot of us we are still carrying around some baggage from things that happened earlier in our life. And so it's been my hope by doing these interviews that not only can I get to know uh, each of the saints uh, better personally, but by doing it online and recording it, that gives the whole congregation an ability to, to really get to know each other better. So I'm glad that, uh, you know, I got a chance to meet you tonight. And uh, once meeting you, I, get, I think I know you quite well. And uh, I appreciate your ministry. Uh, I'll give you the, the last word before we, we say goodnight. Okay. Well, it's nice meeting you. I, I heard about you. 
So I got to meet you too, also tonight. So that's cool. But um, yeah, so it's been fun. And so we know each other a little bit now. See, me and Matthias, we sit and talk a lot, you know, or me and Daniel, we talk. But see, you guys on the internet, we, we don't really talk too much. So this is pretty good. Yeah. All right. Great, brother. Uh, okay. Uh, before we finish up here, is there anything in the chat room, a, a question or a comment that you want to bring to our attention for Brother David? Yeah, I hope the chat room has been listening. Uh, sometimes the chat rooms, they're in an, they're in another planet, brother. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the sometimes, conversation yeah. in the chat room has nothing to do with the program sometimes. <laughs> but if you've been listening, uh, if you have any question or thoughts uh, about this interview tonight, please tell us now before we finish up. Right, let me see. We got Hendrix there. Uh, if you know Jesus, you know Brother Luke. What does that mean, Brother Hendrix? Well, if you know Jesus, you know Brother Luke. P, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like you guys are on flat earth and we're on a globe. <laughs> okay. Uh, well said, Brother Luke. Okay, I said something Hendrix liked, and he's making a lot of comments. We've got Daisy and uh, Daniel. Let me see. I don't see anything... <laughs> In here uh, that applies to the the interview, though. So, uh, brother, what usually happens is the next couple of days, uh, people will uh, watch the video and make a comment on, and not in the chat room, but a comment on the video itself. And uh, it probably is a good idea if you check that out the next few days to see what those comments are. Some of the comments will be directed to you. Okay. So uh, maybe you'd want to uh, look at that and see if you want to get, give a reply. Okay? okay. All right. If there's nothing else, brother, I look forward to, uh, you know, getting to know you better and uh, uh, seeing uh, how you're contributing to the congregation and, and to the whole world uh, through this wonderful internet. All right. Well, thank you. Well, it's nice seeing you guys and I'll see you next time. All right. Everybody watching and in the chat room, bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.